good morning. Uh, my name is Xenia Kunalaki. I'm foreign editor with the uh, Kathimerini Daily, a Greek leading newspaper. I'm very happy to be moderating this uh, panel, a very diverse panel today. Uh, it's the first time, I think, in my life in Greece that uh, uh, women are a majority <laughs> in the panel. <laughs> It's a very rare occasion, you know, and uh, also multiculti. Uh, so our subject today is uh, the role and politics of the great powers. It's a very interesting conference. Unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity to uh, follow the first day of the uh, conference, but uh, I'm very happy that we're kicking off today, the second day. Uh, I beg the speakers to stick to the plan, uh, up to 10 minutes for speakers and 15 minutes for the <laughs> key sp uh, keynote speaker, who's going to start uh, with the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, Kanhara Atsuko, professor of international laws of, uh, at the Sofia University and member of the governing board uh, for UNIMO. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Kanhara, your, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for your very kind introduction of me, uh, because this screen prevents me uh, from showing you my funny face, so <laughs> I will speak standing. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, good morning, distinguished participants and attendants. This is really a great honor for me to deliver keynote address for this session. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude uh, to the organizers of this conference for their very kind invitation of me. I will speak under the title of Great Powers for Global Peace and Order. My keynote address consists of the following three points. You can show them on the screen. First, I will introduce my understanding on the role of great powers as sovereign states toward the creation of the global order. The first point will be the basis for the second and the third point of my presentation. Please allow me uh, to use in appropriate cases the term international law, which may mean the global legal order, as my field is international law. When I intend to emphasize the global nature of the order and the society, I will use the term global. Second, I will consider the significance of the Lausanne Treaty from the perspective of one of the most important aspects in the history of the world and the global order. It is the aspect of the West meets the East and the East meets the West. In this regard, I will focus upon the abolition of the capitulations by the treaty, by the Lausanne Treaty. I'd like to introduce Japan's similar history on this issue. Third, as part of the global peace and order that Lausanne Treaty established, I will touch upon the legal regime of the Straits. In addition to the territorial issues, Japan had particular interest in the regime of the Straits. Just a brief mention on territorial issues. The territorial issues in the Lausanne Treaty have the strong regional nature, but the handling of them by the Lausanne Treaty has a wider significance for Japan and the entire globe as a president of handling of territorial issues by a peace treaty. Then, let me move on to the first point of my presentation. In the preamble of the Lausanne Treaty, it stressed independence and sovereignty. When the Lausanne Treaty was concluded, it was 100 years ago. And now, the most fundamental principle of international law is the same. The principle of respect for sovereignty and independence has been the firm principle since the modern international law was established in the 17th century on the basis of the modern sovereign state system 
in Europe. International law has sovereign states as its legal subjects. Let's focus upon the meaning of subject. There is a dual side to it. First, since international society does not have any authoritative legislative organs, sovereign states themselves create international law by typically concluding treaties. Second, sovereign states are bound by international law and they implement international obligations. The first is the positive side, and we may call it the creator or reformer side. I will focus on this side. In concluding the Lausanne Treaty, great powers as sovereign states took the role of creating international law. The critical point is that there is a requirement for being creators of international law. As sovereign states, it is a maxim to intend to gain and promote their own subjective interests. Such an intent could not be totally criticized as it can work as, motiv as strong motivations to create international law. However, sovereign states, particularly great powers, should seek for a balance, or I might say, compromise between their subjective interests and the common interest for the entire globe. They should find the most appropriate international law rules to satisfy both their subjective interests and common interest of the entire world. This skill and capacity are really the requirement for being great powers which lead the global order. Then, what is the common interest for the globe that the Lausanne Treaty established? Globe certainly should comprehensively cover both the West and the East. I'm moving on to the second point of my presentation. One of the most important aspects in the history of the world and the global order is the West meets the East and the East meets the West. In this regard, I will focus upon the abolition of capitulations by the treaty. I'd like to introduce Japan's different but similar history on this issue. The abolition of capitulations is really necessary in accordance with its preamble that declares the respect for sovereignty and independence of the both sides, certainly for Turkey too. Many authorities point out that the treaty, the Lausanne Treaty, was concluded by the two sides on an equal basis. This is a prominent difference of the Lausanne Treaty from other peace treaties in the history of the world. To explain how it is important to abolish capitulations for respect of sovereignty, I would like to introduce Japan's experience. After its, after its long seclusion policy, Japan opened its door to Western states. Due to the difference of power, it had no choice to conclude in 1858 an equal treaties of commerce with the great powers such as US, UK, the Netherlands, France, and Russia. Under these unequal treaties, Japan admitted extraterritoriality and lost its tariff autonomy. As to the extraterritoriality within Japan's territory, the great powers had consular jurisdiction in certain designated areas, 
Thus, even within its own territory, Japanese jurisdiction was limited in relation to the great powers. In the Normanton incident of 1886, the Normanton, a vessel flying the UK flag, became stranded and sunk in the vicinity of the Wakayama Prefecture of Japan. The vessel with its crew was rescued by the local people of Japan, but all 25 Japanese passengers, without exception, died on board. The fact is that the Japanese were humiliated to death by the captain and crew of the Normanton. They were not given any tools to escape. But by exercising its consular jurisdiction, the Marine Accident Tribunal of UK gave a not guilty decision in the first verdict in favor of the captain. Japan's criminal jurisdiction was limited by the consular jurisdiction of UK. This incident provoked in Japan a strong protest against the consular jurisdiction of the great powers. The Tokugawa government of Japan at that time came to understand that it urgently needed knowledge of international law in alleviate the unfavorable situation. Japan sent people to the Netherlands, for instance, to study international law. In 1897, the Japanese Association of International Law was established, which is now the Japanese Society of International Law. In its more than 120 year history, I served as the first female president from 2020 until the last year. This experience of Japan eloquently proves the importance of the abolition of capitulations by the Lausanne Treaty. As in the Paris Treaty of 1856, in the Lausanne Treaty, the West meets the Near East, and in the history of international law with respect to Japan, the West meets the, e the Far East. To apply on a strictly equal basis the fundamental principle of international law of respect for sovereignty is the critical requirement for international law to acquire the status of the global order in a precise sense. Next, as the third point of my presentation, I will take up the issue of straits. This is also an issue relating to an international or global order. Article 23 of the Lausanne Treaty declared the freedom of transit and of navigation in the Strait of the Dardanelles, the Sea of Marmora, and the Bosporus. A separate convention, the convention relating to the regime of the Straits and Treaty, Turkey, provides for the de detail of the reg regime of the Strait. For convenience, I will call it the Strait Convention. The preamble of the Strait Convention explains that the maintenance of that freedom is necessary to the global peace and the commerce of the world. Article 2 of the Strait Convention reads the transit and the navigation of commercial vessels and aircrafts and of war vessels and aircraft in the Straits in time of peace and in time of war shall henceforth be regulated by the provisions of the attached annex. The annex provides for the rules on the passage in detail, depending on the kinds of vessels, such as commercial vessel and warships and aircraft, 
the situation of the sea areas concerned, such as in peace or in war. Further, cases are distinguished whether Turkey is neutral or a belligerent, and the designated sea areas are delimitized. The observance of the provisions particularly relating to the passage of warships and military aircraft is to be assured by the International Strait Commission under the auspice of the League of Nations. If the freedom of navigation or the security of the delimitalized zone be imperiled by a violation of the provisions concerning the freedom of passage and others, the contracting parties, and in any case, France, UK, Italy, and Japan, are to meet such violations and others by all the means that the Council of League of Nations may decide upon. Thus, the regime of the strait is with maintaining that the regional and the Turkish security forms the global order of the straits, both in peace and in war. Currently, under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, the regime of straits and the special regime of straits being internationally used are uh, functioning for commercial, for international communications, commerce, and security. The Strait Convention, after being at least partly succeeded by the Montreal Convention of 1936, really represents the model regime for straits that are important for global commerce, communications, and security. I'm going to the end of my presentation. I have discussed the role of great powers as legal subject of international law of creating the global order. Here, we share the precious legacy in the experience of the Lausanne Treaty. This important and epoch-making conference reminds us of our honorable burden to maintain and further promote the global order. This is the end of my keynote speech. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Kanaha, for giving us uh, the wider perspective of uh, the treaty with the example of Japan and proving its relevance uh, for the whole order. Uh, next in line is uh, Manolis Kumas, who unfortunately is sick, so uh, Evanthis Hadzivasiliou will read out his speech. Uh, the subject of the lecture is the great powers priorities and aims at the Lausanne Conference, 1922-1923. Uh, Manolis Kumas is Assistant Professor of the History of International Relations at the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Kumas has asked me to convey his apologies. It was a health issue, uh, an illness, sudden illness, but he could not make it. Uh, his paper is this. The primary aim of the Lausanne Peace Conference was to negotiate and resolve the outstanding issues emerging from the First World War and the subsequent dissolution of the Ottoman Empire. So the Greek-Turkish dispute was only one of the major issues addressed by the conference, with the great powers involved in the negotiations, Britain, France, and Italy, having other priorities and key interests. To start with, the Lausanne Conference addressed the issue of the Turkish Straits. Although the Soviet Union did not participate in the conference and so a Soviet envoy was invited solely, solely to negotiate the arrangements for the Straits. Uh, 
On the one hand, the Western powers, especially Britain, advocated the opening of the Straits to international shipping and the establishment of an international committee which would ensure freedom of navigation. On the other hand, the Turkish delegation sought to regain control over the Straits and secure its sovereignty over the region. It should be remembered that the 1920 Treaty of Sevres had granted the control of the Straits to international supervision. Given these circumstances, the Treaty of Lausanne was a compromise of these conflicting interests. Turkey regained com complete sovereignty over the Straits and the adjacent territory, whereas the Great Powers maintained free access to the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. Specific regulations were implemented to guarantee the passage from non-Black Sea countries during peacetime, whereas in time of war, the Straits would be closed to foreign warships unless Turkey was directly involved in the conflict. Finally, under the terms of the treaty, the Straits were declared to be a demilitarized zone to ensure the free and safe passage of ships. Another issue of concern for the Great Powers was the Ottoman public debt. During the 19th and early 20th century, the declining Ottoman Empire had borrowed heavily from various foreign creditors, and now the Great Powers wanted to address the restructuring and repayment of this debt. Western powers, especially France, which alone possessed almost 61% of the Ottoman public debt, sought to ensure that the new Turkish state would honor its financial obligations. The conference discussions revolved around finding a solution that balanced the interests of the creditors and the financial stability of the newly established Republic of Turkey. As a result, the Treaty of Lausanne recognized Turkey's responsibility for the debt and outlined the terms of repayment. The Turkish government assumed a portion of the Ottoman debt and negotiations took place to determine the repayment schedule and the financial arrangements. The Great Powers were also interested in maintaining the system of capitulations in Turkey, for which we have already heard. Uh, Capitulations were a series of agreements and privileges granted by the Ottoman Empire to, the Euro to European powers and other states since the 16th century. These agreements provided extraterritorial rights and legal privileges to foreign nationals leaving or doing business in the Ottoman Empire. They exempted foreign individuals and their property from the jurisdiction of Ottoman law and allowed them to be subject to the laws of their own home countries. The capitulations therefore became a contentious issue during the late Ottoman period as they were seen as undermining sovereign, so, uh, Ottoman sovereignty and impeding the modernization efforts of the empire. They also created an unequal legal and economic environment that disadvantaged us Ottoman subjects and indig indigenous businesses. Despite heavy pressure from the great powers, Article 28 of the treaty provided for the complete abolition of the capitulations in Turkey. <coughs> Furthermore, the great powers insisted on maintaining all the contracts with Western companies, including US companies, with which the Ottoman Empire had in the past granted rights to services, natural resources, and infrastructure projects, such as railway, ports, and other public works. The final text of the treaty fully satisfied the interests of the Western powers. According to the economic protocol annexed to the treaty, all the contracts that had been concluded between the Ottoman Empire and foreign companies all individuals before autumn 1914, when the Ottomans joined the First World War, were to be implemented. This provision did not apply only for Turkey, but was extended to all territories which belonged to the Ottoman Empire, but after the war became parts of other states or gained their independence. In these circumstances, the great powers not only managed to secure their interest in the Middle East, but also laid down the foundation of a, for a future economic domination in the, era, in the uh, area. As far as Britain was concerned, it had two main priorities. First, to retain control over the Mosul region, located in what is now northern Iraq. Britain's desire was driven by a combination of economic, imperial, geopolitical, and security considerations. The most important factor was, of course, the potential for significant oil reserves in Mosul. The discovery of oil in neighboring areas, such as Kirkuk, had already demonstrated the strategic and economic value of controlling oil-rich territories. British oil companies, particularly the, the Iraq Petroleum Company, had established interest and investments in the area and sought to 
maintain access to the potential oil wealth in Mosul. The second priority of the British delegation in Lausanne was to confirm the British sovereignty over Cyprus, which played a vital role in the effort of Britain to control the sea routes in the Mediterranean. Needless to say, the British achieved both aims. The Treaty of Lausanne reaffirmed British sovereignty over Cyprus, while in 1926, Mosul was finally granted by the League of Nations, of Nations to Iraq a British mandate in the Middle East. France opted for retaining control over Alexandretta and included within the borders of Syria, which it had received under the League of Nations mandate system. The issue of Alexandretta was a point of contention between France and Turkey during the Lausanne Conference, as the Turkish delegation insisted that the region had a significant Turkish population and should be integrated into the newly established Republic of Turkey. Ultimately, a compromise was reached and Alexandretta was placed under the administration of a separate autonomous entity within French-controlled Syria. In 1939, however, following negotiations with France and Turkey, Alexandretta became fully integrated into the Republic of Turkey. Finally, Italy's main objective in Lausanne was to secure its territorial gains in the Mediterranean. The Italian delegation sought to strengthen its control over the Dodecanese Islands occupied by the Italian forces during the war against the Ottoman Empire in the early 1910s. The fascist government under Benito Mussolini achieved its primary aim as the Treaty of Lausanne reaffirmed Italy's sovereignty over the islands. In conclusion, it is important to note that the interests of the great powers were not always aligned and there were disagreements and rivalries among them during the peace conference. The negotiations and compromises reached in Lausanne reflected the complex interactions between these great powers and their specific interests in the region. In any case, the Lausanne Treaty marked a significant milestone in the post-World War, uh, First World War reorganization of the Middle East with the great powers achieving almost all their aims in the area of great economic and strategic interest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evanthis, for being the messenger. Uh, so next uh, paper, The Great Powers at the Twilight of the Eastern Question. Uh, Odile Moreau, Professor of History at the University of Montpellier 3. Uh, the floor is yours. Can you use my Thank you very much. Good morning. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, and it's really a great honor for me to be taking part in this major conference, a uh, very interesting conference. Um, my presentation will deal with Lausanne, the Greek powers, and the Eastern question. While the Lausanne Conference opened on November 20, 1922, the Greek powers were confronted with the final act of the famous Eastern question. In fact, the terminology used was Oriental Conference, or Peace Conference for the Orient, or Conference on Eastern Affairs. Indeed, the Conference of Lausanne was not only the renegotiation of a treaty that was less than three years old, the Treaty of Sèvres. From Sèvres to Lausanne, the road was not linear. It had been punctuated by other intermediate conferences. In my presentation, I will address two main points. First, what do we mean by the Eastern question? And second, a winding road to Lausanne. What do we mean by the Eastern question? Strictly speaking, the Eastern question began in 1774 with the signing of the Treaty of Kichukainaja following a war against Russia that ended in defeat for the Ottoman Empire. The end of the Eastern question took place in 1923 with the proclamation of the Republic of Turkey. In the 19th century, the Crimean War, 1853-1856, was a catalyst for a new cycle in the crisis in the East. The Treaty of Paris of 1856 allowed the Ottoman Empire to join the European Council. Then the Russian-Ottoman War of 1877-1878 was a new turning point in the Eastern question with a combination of internal crisis and international crisis. In the last quarter of the 19th century, the Greek powers imposed their will on the world by the Berlin Treaties. 
The Treaty of Berlin of, in 1878 marked the beginning of the dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire. Finally, after the First World War, they partitioned the Middle East. We are witnessing a long and violent end to the First World War in Europe and in the Middle East with occupying regimes. This is the case of Istanbul, the only capital to be occupied. The occupation of Istanbul was a trauma after the murderous armistice of 30 October 1918. No other capital city of defeated powers was occupied. The occupation of Berlin, the capital of Germany, had been considered by George Clemenceau, French prime minister, but the idea was not retained. Neither Berlin, nor Vienna, nor Budapest, nor Sofia were occupied. Only Istanbul was occupied by the military. It seemed that the occupation of Istanbul is directly linked to the Eastern question. After the First World War, the military occupation had the mission of enforcing and applying the peace treaties. And also after the First World War, what is new is that the military command is subordinated to a civilian administration. And it is really a new form of domination. A winning road to Lausanne. The road to the Lausanne conference was long and a long and a winding one. Negotiation and diplomatic advances paved the way for the Lausanne Conference, a long process that began in the autumn of 1922 and ended in the summer of 1923. The Treaty of, of Serbs signed um, <clears throat> in 1920 by representative of the Ottoman Sultan was the last peace treaty to emerge from the First World War. A number of inter-allied conferences were held in various European countries to negotiate issues that had not been resolved at the Paris Conference of 1919. One of the characteristics of these inter-allied conferences was the ostracization of countries defeated in the First World War who were not invited to participate. Peace conferences were held in early 1921, including the Paris Conference from the end of January uh, at the end of January 1921, and the question of the application of the Treaty of Serre was discussed during the session of January 25. In addition to Allied powers, representatives of the Ottoman Empire, of the Ankara government, and Greece were invited to the London Conference, which took place in, <clears throat> in February and March 1921. However, the London Conference failed to pacify relations between the Ottoman Empire, the Ankara government, and Greece, and the war continued. Thus, special representatives were dispatched to Anatolia to conduct negotiations. These missions were led, for example, on behalf of France by Henri Franklin Bouillon. The Franco Turkish Franco Bouillon Agreement, which led to the Treaty of Ankara, Ankara and Ashmasse, signed on October. 1921 was a major turning point in relations between France and the Ankara government. Negotiations continued in various diplomatic arena with the aim of silencing the guns. At the Paris Conference in March 1922, an armistice proposal was submitted to the Ankara government, also to the Istanbul government, and to Greece. However, these peace and negotiations were also unsuccessful. Then, even at the Lausanne Conference, the agenda of Great Britain and France were quite distinct. As far as possible, France tried to play its own part and to protect its interest in Turkey, and this involved a closer relationship with the Ankara government. Just to conclude, I may say that diver divergent sensibilities and approaches persist among the Allies, both during the First World War and, of course, afterwards. This is particularly noticeable in the diplomatic negotiation forums that are the peace conferences. And in this respect, distrust and even mistrust were recurrent in relations between France and Great Britain, particularly with regard to the Middle East question. And it was also the case during the uh, Lausanne conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dale.
uh, the better struggle for peace, London versus Ankara at the Lausanne negotiations 1922-1923 uh, is the subject of the paper uh, from Sevdap Demirci, director at the Ataturk Institute at the Bogazi University. Well, um, uh, thank you and good morning to you all. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank you for the organizers as well uh, for inviting me to this conference. Uh, I feel really privileged uh, to be among so many distinguished uh, scholars. Uh, once again, many thanks uh, for everyone who put their effort in, in bringing every, every one of us here. Um, I'd like to start with, uh, uh, with a, um, a brief uh, historical background. How did we come here? How did uh, Turkey and how did the grand, uh, uh, great powers come here? What was the event, uh, a political uh, procedure or uh, political uh, uh, events behind this uh, issue? We all know that. <clears throat> From the 19th century onwards, up until the First World War, the main agenda on the, in, in the international relations was the Eastern question, which my colleagues uh, uh, touched upon uh, 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 very elegantly. Uh, the Eastern question, the, the uh, Ottoman Empire faced multiple crises throughout these 150 years or so, or 200 years or so. The, the uh, Eastern question, the expression came to uh, 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 used to indicate the problems created by the decline and the gradual dissolution of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, uh, that a problem, as I said, remained a century and a half, and it became the most lasting and intractable of all diplomatic questions. The Great War, 1914-1918, we all know, the Great War was the, uh, nothing but the culmination of this uh, long process of dissolution. So 1918, when we reached 1918, we can no longer talk about the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire joined the war on the side of the central powers and lost the war, was defeated by the Allies, and signed a treaty, not a treaty, signed an armistice in 1918, which brought, Mudros armistice, which brought the end of the Ottoman Empire. We can no longer talk about from the Ottoman Empire from 1918 onwards. And in two years' time, following this, uh, uh, not a treaty, but, um, convention, let's put it that way, the Allies, um, in line with their secret, wartime secret agreements, prepared a peace treaty, which was imposed upon the Ottoman Empire. We all know that that was a served treaty, 1920. Uh, this was, uh, in fact, uh, probably the uh, uh, last nail in the coffin, if you like. Uh, no more Ottoman Empire, no more Eastern question. Turks, uh, using the British archival documents, Turks, bag and baggage out of Europe. But uh, something, this, this treaty uh, called Sir was entirely contrary to the policy of uh, preserving the integrity of and independence of uh, uh, Turkey. So um, uh, it was the policy, it was contrary to the policy of preserving a compact territory and defensible frontiers. No articles were discussed or negotiated. The Allies believed that they had finally reached the, uh, 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 the solution to the Eastern question. However, the rising nationalist movement in Ankara under the leadership of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk put an effective break to this uh, quick solution. The nationalists expressed their uh, determination to fight in order to avoid its realization. The alternative, their alternative to this treaty, to the Treaty of Sir, which had been imposed upon the uh, uh, Ottoman Empire by the uh, great powers or by the Allies, their uh, alternative to this treaty was the National Pact. We call it in Turkish misak milli They defined their goals in this National Pact, and they were trying to realize this. With the 
with the decisive victory of, uh, of the Turkish forces over the Greek army, the first stage of the national struggle had been won. Uh, with the Mudros armistice, which replaced, uh, 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 with the uh, Mudanya armistice, which replaced Mudros, the second uh, part, a long battle was accomplished because it put an end to the hostilities between Greek, uh, Greeks and, and the Turks. Uh, at Lausanne, the third stage began. It was a kind of a transfer, a transfer of power from soldiers to diplomats. What did the Ankara government want? Why did they go to Lausanne? What were their objectives in Lausanne? They had three objectives. Number one, um, they were not the defeated Ottoman Empire. They were not Istanbul government, which had uh, signed a Serb and a Mudros Armistice. They were the victorious powers, and they, were, they, did, they came to Lausanne as a victorious power, but not as a supplicant. That was number one. Their standpoint was Mudanya armistice, whereas the Allies, or British, uh, standpoint was the Mudros armistice. Uh, number three, they, uh, uh, they were aiming to achieve the, uh, to realize the national pact, nothing but, but the national pact. National pact came to represent the nationalist requirements and form the basis of all negotiations with the Allies, particularly with Britain. Um, and number three, the third aim of the Turkish delegation in Lausanne was to add a diplomatic victory to the military victory which had been won or which had been uh, achieved in the field. So uh, very briefly, what did the Turks mean by national, uh, uh, national pact or misak milli? Very briefly. Number one, the complete scrapping the Treaty of Serbs. A plebiscite for trace. We would like to ask who they would like to be part of it. The restoration of Mosul to Turkey, the freedom of straits, but provided with the independence of Turkey and the safety of Istanbul were ensured. No military restrictions, no financial or economic control, no capitulations, capitulations, privileges given to the foreigners, but the full sovereignty and independence of Turkey, in short, the national pact in its entirety. What was British uh, objective, the great power and the uh, representative of the Allies, in fact, because uh, British uh, Foreign Secretary Lord Curzon was the uh, uh, chairman, was the head of the conference, we all know. What was British objectives? Their aims were far from compatible with those of Turkey. Curzon, number one, aimed to restore British prestige in the East. That was number one objective. Number two, he wanted to ensure the freedom of the Straits, free passage. Number three, to win Mosul for Iraq, which was a British mandate. And number four, uh, many of my colleagues just uh, override this, but that was very important in British archival material. The, this is uh, the number four, is to drive a wedge between Ankara and Moscow. Because Ankara and Moscow were terribly close. They had uh, the same line, if you like. The Tsar was down. And before, three weeks before the uh, Lausanne conference started, Turkish Grand National Assembly decided, that, uh, the, decided to abolish the, uh, the uh, sultanate. So the sultan was down. Uh, second thing, they had their revolution. 
or on the verge of a revolution, and Turks were just about to begin after the uh, uh, treaty. And Tur uh, they were both, Bolsheviks were fighting against the uh, great powers or against the, what they call, imperialist powers, and Turks were doing the same thing. Uh, uh, Turks were fighting against the imperialist powers as well, Britain, France, Italy, and well, Russia. Uh, big power. So uh, they had a very close uh, uh, relations, and, and uh, uh, we, uh, we all know that um, Russians or Bolsheviks uh, uh, helped greatly uh, throughout the uh, to, to, to Turkish nationalists uh, throughout the uh, war of uh, independence or a national struggle in terms of uh, financial help or, or, or uh, arm uh, supplement and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, before I um, move on to these um, uh, very, very tough discussions, I don't know whether I might have a, a time, but I'd like to uh, uh, state a, a one fact which is uh, quite an important from uh, our point of view and from a British or great powers point of view that selection of Lausanne as a, a conference site created considerable difficulties for the Turkish delegation. Now you're going to ask why. Because Turkish delegation had uh, one, or one, and a half, one or two pages of instruction, and uh, these instructions made it difficult to cope with the newly emerging uh, uh, um, issues in the conference throughout these discussions or negotiations. So they had to send a telegram and ask for new and fresh instructions from Ankara. And this uh, communication went through a telegrams. And there was one telegram line in, in, uh, in Turkey, which was called Eastern Line. And guess who was controlling the line? British. So a uh, British uh, uh, knew everything what was going on on the Turkish side, and these deciphered uh, telegrams uh, gave an immense uh, uh, advantage to the uh, British side because they knew, he knew, Curzon knew how much he could push Ismet Pasha. Uh, in the uh, negotiations so that uh, he could organize his agenda accordingly. For example, according to the official uh, uh, documents uh, or the original documents, the Mosul issue, the Mosul question was the first question that needed to be discussed. Guess what happened? Because everyone, and especially the uh, uh, Foreign Secretary of Britain knew that Mosul was going to be the crux of the conference. The conference will be break on this issue. So as a chairman of the conference, he just rearranged the conference agenda, uh, took the Mosul issue out of the agenda, and said to Ismet Pasha, Ismet Pasha, let's talk in private uh, negotiation, shall we? We could uh, talk about uh, while we were having a lunch, or a tea, or a coffee, or a, a, a brunch on Sunday. Uh, as long as we came to a conclusion, or at least an understanding on the issue, we could bring uh, the uh, problem to the conference table. Otherwise, you and I will be fighting over on it, and that won't look nice uh, for the international community. So, uh, uh, Musul, so he just uh, uh, changed the agenda, and he knew that there were two issues that uh, Turks or Osmet Pasha could not uh, agree. He had the full authorization, Ismet Pasha, the, uh, the, uh, Turkish, uh, the leader of the Turkish delegation or the head of Turkish delegation, knew exactly, uh, he had clear instructions that if two issues were on the uh, table to be negotiated, he had to go back to Ankara. He didn't have to ask for new uh, authorization or new uh, instructions from cabinet or from the government. Number one, my colleagues has touch up on it, capitulation, privileges given to the foreigners. Under no circumstances, Turkey was uh, going to accept these capitulations. Uh, uh, and number three, two, number one, capitulations, because it was uh, um, a, a big barrier in front of the uh, um, political and uh, judicial and economic independence and sovereignty. Number two, 
uh, a national home for the Armenians in the eastern part of Turkey. That was also against uh, or contrary to the uh, national sovereignty of Turkey. Um, uh, uh, let me read what uh, uh, from the archives. That I would like to uh, 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 read. Uh, just one sentence, uh, how this information, uh, the signal intelligence, uh, helped uh, British uh to, to conduct uh, uh, the negotiations. Uh, the chief negotiator for Britain says, the information we obtained at the psychological moments from secret sources was invaluable to us and put us in the position of a man who is playing bridge and knows the cards in his adversary's hand. Not only the signal intelligence, but the intelligence from the region, especially from Mosul area. I have read hundreds of hundreds and thousands of thousands of reports from the intelligence officer sending daily, regularly to the foreign office saying that Turks, under no circumstances, Turks should be allowed to have a plebiscite in Mosul because Turks were asking for a plebiscite. Okay, you say the Mosul is yours, and we claim that Mosul is part of the motherland. Let's go and ask the people who live there. The Kurds live there, Turks, Tur Turkmen's, and uh, to a certain extent, uh, extent Arabs. Let's go and ask them. No, no. Uh, uh, the, the archival document says, the uh, Kurds said no, this is not possible, Ismet Pasha. These, uh, first of all, it's a, a mountainous area. You have to find the donkeys. You have to find people. You have to take all these papers up there to ask Kurds whether or not they want to be part of uh, Turkey or they want to be part of uh, a UK. These Kurds would eat these papers under no circumstances. We allow you to have a, a, a plebiscite there. But I know why. Oh, uh, time's, up. About, uh, time's up. Uh, uh, can I just uh, conclude? Okay. Can I just few uh, yes. words conclude? Okay. Because uh, British uh, intelligence reports say that 99% of the uh, Kurds would choose um, uh, uh, Turkey. Anyway, uh, let me uh, um, <laughs> finish the conclusion. Conclusion, because I couldn't go. Conclusion. Turkey alone. Among the defeated powers of the First World War, succeeded in rising from its own ruins, rejecting the dictated peace imposed on, on it by the victors. So, the Zan Treaty brought an international recognition uh, of the demands formulated in the Turkish National Pact. Second outcome or conclusion, Lausanne Conference was the final phase in the long-standing Eastern question. The treaty sealed the fate of the Ottoman territories. Number three, it was a, a, um, a great turning point in Turkish history because it closed the chapter a long war years and introduced security and stability in Turkey's foreign relations. And the last sentence, thank you for your patience, it also represented a landmark in the history of the Middle East. It changed the map by creating a new system. Thank you ever so much for your patience. Thank you, President, for your time. Andonis Klapsis, Assistant Professor of Diplomacy and International Organization at the University of the Peloponnese on Italian Diplomacy and Near Eastern Affairs from Sevres to Lausanne. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it, was, it is a great pleasure to be among such distinguished uh, scholars. Uh, I would try to be as brief as possible and to give a general overview of, Greece, of Italy's strategic, uh, strategic aims and the shaping and reshaping of Italian foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Near Eastern and Eastern Mediterranean uh, issues uh, between the Treaty of Sevres and the Treaty of Lausanne. So in the aftermath of the First World War, uh, Italy had, uh, uh, the Italians were mostly interested in achieving two major territorial aims in the Eastern Mediterranean. The one was to secure their control and to extend their control to a legal sovereignty over the Dodecanese Islands, which they had occupied ever since May 1912. That is during the Italy, Italian uh, Ottoman War of 1911-1912 over Libya. And their second major strategic aim was to secure control over 
uh, a sphere of influence over a greater area uh, in the north uh, west, uh, southwestern uh, Asia Minor, that is to control the coastline roughly between the city of Smyrna, modern time Izmir, and the port of uh, Antalya. Uh, if you look at it at the map, you will see that it is exactly the coastline which is opposite the Dodecanese Island. So basically, they would try to control the whole, the whole area, which would give them a great strategic advantage of having direct access to the Eastern Mediterranean uh, Basin. We have to take into consideration that, by, that back then, uh, Great Britain had uh, control over uh, uh, Cyprus, so this would create a new balance of power between the two, the two great uh, powers. Uh, from the um, Italian point of view, these uh, aims were based on the um, uh, promises that were given by the Allies, by the victorious Antant powers during the war, uh, the powers had uh, promised uh, the Italians that they would o o definitely get the Dodecanese Islands and control over uh, Southwest uh, Asia Minor. But after the end of the war, the Italians uh, found out that it was not uh, that easy to implement their aims because of the fact that the Greeks had also uh, claims over more or less uh, the same regions. Uh, that is why the Italians were almost totally against every Greek claim that was posed during the Paris Peace Conference between 1919 and 1920. And um, they were obliged, of course, to sign the Peace Treaty of Sevres, but they were not at all fond of the, the clauses of the Peace Treaty of Sevres. According to the Peace Treaty of Sevres, the Italians gained their much-wanted sphere of influence over southwest uh, Asia Minor, but with no access to the city of Izmir, to the city of Smyrna, which were given uh, to the Greeks, uh, not uh, under uh, sovereignty, but under the prospect of uh, imposing Greek sovereignty over the region of Smyrna. That was a major strategic defeat from the Italian point of view. At the same time, the Italians were forced to sign a separate treaty with uh, Greece, uh, which was uh, an adjunct to the uh, main peace treaty of Sevres. According to this Greek-Italian uh, treaty, the Italians promised to hand over the Dodecanese Islands to Greece, with two exceptions. They would definitely keep the tiny island of Castellorizo, which would give them an access to the Eastern Mediterranean, and they would keep for some years the island of Rhodes, but with the promise that after some years they would hand it over uh, to, to Greece. It is interesting that uh, the handing over of Rhodes to Greece was somehow associated with the future of Cyprus. According to the agreement, the handing over of Rhodes to Greece would take place only after the British would hand over Cyprus to Greece. So it is a characteristic um, situation when they wanted to keep the balance of power in the Eastern Mediterranean. And by having Castellorizo, they would have a, an additional advantage to the Eastern uh, Mediterranean. As I said before, the Italians signed the Peace Treaty of Sevres, and they also signed the separate Greek-Italian uh, treaty. But they were not very fond of their clauses, because they felt that the treaty did not give them the advantages that they had uh, wished for for uh, many years. Most importantly, they saw very unfavorably the prospect of uh, Greece becoming a major power or a medium-sized power uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East. For the Italians, any Greek gain was a loss for them. <coughs> and um, uh, this became even worse uh, when they t took into consideration the fact that, in their mind, Greece would become a sort of a local strategic subcontractor to Great Britain. It would be uh, Great Britain's uh, local ally. So this meant that uh, the Italian influence over the Eastern Mediterranean would uh, uh, become uh, sm smaller and smaller, weaker and, uh, and weaker. If you put it in uh, football terms, I would say that Italy was uh, the smaller of the great powers, so it would be in the first division of the diplomatic league of that time, but it would be at the bottom of the, of the table, whereas the extended Greeks, the extended, extended Greece of the Treaty of Serve would be a, a team playing in the second diplomatic division, but it would be at the top of this division, so 
the, the difference between the, coup, the two would become uh, smaller and, and smaller. This is why the Italians uh, wanted to, to change the, the Treaty of Sevres, and they took the opportunity of a great, of a great, great mistake, that is the return of King Constantine I to, to the throne in December 1920, and they, they used this return as a pretext in order to disassociate themselves from the clauses of the, of the Treaty of Sevres. Roughly the same uh, pretext was uh, used by the French as well, who also wanted uh, to, uh, to change the, the Treaty of Sevres. To make a long story short, uh, during 1921, the Italians started to have contacts with uh, the, um, the Turkish government in Ankara, yes. so that is with uh, Mustafa Kemal, yes. and they gradually signed uh, various agreements with uh, the Turkish nationals, which provided, most importantly, the evacuation of southwestern Anatolia mm -hmm. by Italian troops and handing over part of their uh, ammunition and so on to the Turks. Yes. This was very important for the evolution of the Greek-Turkish war uh, in Asia Minor. Uh, 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 most importantly, if you take into consideration that by uh, the, the same time, the, Itali the French also evacuated right. southeastern uh, Asia Minor, and this gave uh, Mustafa Kemal and his government the opportunity to uh, be able to focus on the Western Front, mm -hmm. that is, the front with uh, the Greeks, without having any uh, implications to his south borders. He, Mustafa Kemal was also clever enough to make another step even before trying to get in contact with the French and the Italians. He got in contact with uh, the Bolsheviks and they dismantled Armenia in the, uh, in the eastern front of uh, Turkey. That is, by the mid-1921, the, the Turks were in a position to focus uh, all, all their efforts uh, against uh, the Greeks. Uh, after uh, three, the, three years of war between Greece and Turkey, as you all know, the war was ended in uh, August, September 1922 with the total defeat of the Greek army and the total uh, victory of uh, the Turkish nationalists. This gave the opportunity for, uh, convening, for the convention of a new uh, uh, peace conference, which at, uh, was held in Lausanne, as you all know. It is interesting that immediately after the collapse of the Greek uh, front in Asia Minor, immediately after the defeat of the Greek army in Asia Minor, the first thing that the Italians did was uh, to, um, uh, to denounce the Greek-Italian Treaty of Sevres, that is to, uh, to say that the Dodecanese would remain under Italian uh, sovereignty. Uh, it is also interesting uh, and not coincidental in relation to the reshaping of Italian uh, foreign policy that exactly at the same time Benito Mussolini rose uh, into, in power in Italy in October 1922, that is only after a few, we a few weeks after the, the Greek defeat in Asia Minor. It is also interesting that Mussolini made his first diplomatic appearance in Lausanne. In Lausanne. He was present at the inaugural session of the Lausanne uh, peace uh, conference. He did not attend the conference per se, but he was present during the first day of, he was the only great uh, uh, European leader who was present at uh, Lausanne. Uh, during the Lausanne peace, Confer peace conference, it was obvious that uh, Italy had one main territorial priority, that is to keep the Dodecanese island, which was uh, an easy task, because Greece was not in a position to make any claims over the Dodecanese Islands, and uh, Turkey had decided that, he, uh, that the Dodecanese Islands would not become, would not be part of, uh, of the Turkish uh, uh, territory. They had other uh, priorities over uh, Thrace and so on. Um, so uh, the Italians made it, made it perfectly clear that they would keep the Dodecanese, uh, whereas at the same time, the British made it perfectly clear that it would keep Cyprus so against a new balance of power in the Eastern Mediterranean. Mediterranean. The Italians uh, were, um, uh, had already decided that their long wished sphere of influence over southwestern Anatolia was a thing of the past, and they, would, they should forget about it. But they, uh, after a few years, they remembered it again. I would comment on this uh, briefly. They had a second interest, which was 
not that important. The question of the capitulations, which, were referred, which was referred uh, previously, uh, many Italian citizens were uh, benefit, benefited from the capitulation, so the Italians ideally wanted the continuation of the old regime of the capitulation, but this was difficult mm -hmm. uh, to, to achieve. Um, <clears throat> the signing of the Peace Treaty of Lausanne, which gave uh, a legal... Uh, um, uh, which gave the Italian so, so legal sovereignty over the Dodecanese, did not at all mean that the Italians lost their interest over Near Eastern or Eastern Mediterranean affairs. To the contrary, they continued having great interest over these uh, affairs. And um, we have to take into consideration that the map of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East and the Balkans was completely different back then than it is now to give the Italian perspective of, of things. The Italians had control of the Dodecanese. They had control over Libya. And they had great influence over Albania, which gradually became, uh, at the end of the interwar period, part of the Italian uh, empire. So they had a triangle over the Eastern Mediterranean, the Balkans, and the Near East, which gave them not only direct access to these areas, but, what, but, but that also uh, made them uh, a truly Eastern Mediterranean and part, partially Balkan uh, power. Uh, it is also interesting that only one month after the signing of the Lausanne Peace Treaty, the Italians invaded Greece because uh, they occupied the island of Corfu in the uh, Ionian Sea, which uh, was a, a, a very fair, the very first example of the new foreign policy that would be followed by Benito Mussolini, and it was also a, a, a great uh, failure of the uh, League of Nations uh, system mm. and, and so on. Um, and just to comment on what I said before, the Italians had signed the Peace Treaty of Lausanne, but under Mussolini, at least for a certain period of time, at least until the mid-1920s, they had not forgotten entirely their old dream of uh, implementing a sort of sphere of influence over parts of Anatolia. Uh, it is interesting that between 1925 and 1926, when Greece was under the dictatorial rule of Theodoros Pangalos, uh, Greece also tried to make contacts with the Italians in order to form a sort of an alliance which would have an anti-Turkish uh, orientation. And this uh, thought was also based on the fact that at exactly that point of time, the British was also uh, in very bad terms with the Turks over the Mosul question, which was not entirely solved during uh, the, the, the Lausanne Peace Conference. So the prospect of a clash between Great Britain and Turkey was possible. Sure. The British tried to use the Italians and the Greeks as a sort of a counterbalance yeah. power uh, against uh, the Turks. What the British did was to secure uh, the Mosul uh, region uh, against the Turks. And when they secured it, they told the Greeks and the Italians that that was over. The peace treaty of Lausanne is final, and you cannot change it. That is my brief comment on foreign policy, uh, Italian foreign policy. Thank you so much. Great. Just in time. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, uh, our distinguished uh, speakers, uh, the audience, and of course, Eliamep for hosting us, and the Municipality of Athens for giving us the uh, nice conference room. Thank you so much.